This is episode two of Delivered. The focus is Dale and I unpacking the claim that the client is always right. We hear it often that the customer is always right. That's a very common saying. But is the client always right? And Dale, I want to ask you, have you been in a situation where the client has asked you for something that was wrong? So <laughs> whew, we talk about this a lot. I would say... You know, right and wrong is a very subjective term and there's always something to uncover, right? There's always the why. Why do you need this? And then looping back is what you're asking me actually doing what you want, right? So I guess a recent example of that is just happened to me the other day. I get a phone call. Mike, you know, it, when you're doing SEO, you get stuff like this all the time. You know, my cousin, my cousin was in the parking lot of Walmart and they, they, they did this Google search for right. tires and I didn't come up. I didn't come up. <laughs> and I'm like, first of all, you know, I validate it. I'm really, geez, I'm really sorry that, you know, you've, you've encountered the situation. Let me ask some questions. You know, I should come up when someone types tires and, you know, at that <laughs> point, my, my initial knee jerk reaction was, um, Instead of immediately going on the defensive, which is, well, tires is a terrible phrase. You can have bike tires, motorcycle tires. You could be buying tires. Maybe you need a, you've, you know, there's a million things. So I try to educate them. If you just get found for tires, you're going to have a million different people coming to your site that are completely irrelevant. And then you're going to say, why did 10,000 people come to my site, but only one person contacted me? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a good example where, you know, I try to, un they were so adamant on this, even after explaining it, I was like, let me show you some examples. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, yeah, we've all been there and you can tell right now I'm super heated about it because, right. you know, we do so much work and we care about it and we explain it. But sometimes when you get technical, if we don't do the best job or they forget, we need to come back to that mm -hmm. and revisit it. Okay. So yeah, you, you had a, a client who approached you uh, looking for an unrealistic result or, and uh, you know, you had to be in the position of not insulting them, but also reaffirming that, you know, you're, you're wrong in what you're saying. I think, um, I think I, dis dis I disagree is probably a better word than wrong. I disagree. That's, <laughs> well, right. it, it is the that's opposite of right. But. Right. Yeah. Right. I disagree is better than wrong. That's so true. So, um, I think it's an important distinction to make here an important, um, you know, like we mentioned at the beginning, the customer is always right. Is the client always right? I think it's an important conversation to talk about the difference between a customer and a client. And so um, I think the main, the high level difference in my view, and Dale, I'll, I'll see what you think, is that customers buy products and clients buy services, but that's not super helpful because that breaks down along a lot of different, a lot of different ways that breaks down. I think a more valuable way of looking at the difference between customers and clients is more in how companies perceive it and how they treat the people that are serving. If you view those people as customers, you're going to be in the business of customer service. You'll be in the business of people pleasing. You'll be in the business. Uh, you'll, you're going to lose power in your relationship because you're, you're doing a customer centric customer service approach. You're probably going to compromise your values uh, and the integrity of your work because uh, when you're doing customer service, it's not necessarily about what you want or what is right. It's about what the customer needs or what they think they need, which can be wrong. People think they need the wrong things all the time. Um, sure. And then you might burn out because if you're constantly in the business of pleasing customers, uh, you know, that, that especially when you're doing complex work, like the stuff you're talking about, Dale, technical complex work, it's, it's likely to lead to burnout. If you view them as clients, which is a different way to look at those people entirely, you're going to start to focus on objectives. You're going to be focused on what is the return on the investment that you're delivering to those clients. You're going to expect to get more respect if they're your client. If you say that you're a client, like you're, you know, in any professional service firm, you that demands more respect than saying they're a customer. So um, you're going to expect more respect, and that's good for your work in a lot of ways. That makes you. That makes you more able to say no. That makes you uh, a higher value perception in the eyes of your, your client is to be, uh, you know, to, to, to view themselves as um, a client and not a customer. 
you're going to have more confidence. I believe if you view your, the people you do work for as clients and not customers, and you'll probably do better work because you're not going to have to compromise the integrity of it, uh, to, to please the people that you're delivering this, this service to. So I don't know, Dale, that's that difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it, the, the end result is when you become an order taker and you don't help the person identify the outcome and loop in the request of the outcome, everybody loses. They lose right. because right. they don't achieve what they want. And you lose because you're spinning your wheels and you're caught in this cycle of making changes that don't actually solve the problem. And that's not, that's not good for anybody. Mm. Well, so how would you, how would you identify when a potential prospect, so someone you're not necessarily working with yet, but someone you might want to work with, how do you identify where they're going to break down? Like whether they're going to break right, down so we, the customer side. Right. So one of the things that we do when we want to help people with is how do you, how do you prevent the situation from happening? Right. Where your your you know, your client is um, displeased with your service and not getting what they need. How do you identify, how do you stop from getting in that situation? Right. So I think, in your first phone call, the difference between a customer and a client is you start listening and you start asking questions, right? You ask as many questions as you can think of. Be curious, right? Look for little warning signs. Uh, some warning signs that I think red flags for me. I could do it if I had more time. Mm -hmm. This to me is the biggest red flag because they already know how to do it. Right. And I will guarantee, I'll guarantee that they're view of delivering that service and what to do to get results is much different than mine, right? Mm -hmm. um, they don't have the experience. They don't have the breadth of clients. Like they don't have dozens of clients and they're not out there seeing right. the things that I see. They have a very limited scope, which is fine. I just don't want to be caught in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. My spouse, nephew, son, uncle right. could do the they could right. do this, but I'd rather hire a company. Well, you know, that uncle, that spouse, they're going to be on you the whole time. And again, I don't think their, their vision, their, their ideas of results may not match mine. And I'm not willing to, um, I'm not willing to find out. I may right. try to flush that out. We, we, I may try to flush that out and get that person involved and see if we do have an alignment, but that's definitely a red flag. Um, mm -hmm. Another big one is um, they start telling you, exactly how you're going to do it on the first call or the second call. Um, they should be asking, they should be curious. They should be talking about outcomes and they should be asking questions like, do you know how to, or how would you, you know, how, mm. how do you know what the Google guidelines are to follow? Well, I tell them, well, I go to the Google site and they give them to us and that's how we follow it. You know, so that's a, that's a good conversation there. Um, they should be consultants in their own business. If you have a really great call, they should be getting off that call saying, you know what? I need to do some more research about this before I make a decision. I haven't thought of all these things, but I'm going to get back to you on it. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. a good sign that someone's willing to um, approach the outcome with you rather than just saying slam this button on my page i want to be number one for this you know what, whatever it may be um with that said we you know i don't expect our clients to be submissive or obedient right in the end if 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 they can show me how what they've asked for gets them to the ultimate outcome they want and maybe i didn't see it in the beginning i'm totally open for it but i definitely want to create a partnership where both people are on the same page and we're working towards the same place. And you're the, if they're asking these questions on the first call, you're not going to get it. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I think that those are great points to, you know, if, if I had more time, I think that that's really dangerous because then they start looking at your rate and they start doing some math and like, how much is that per hour? How many hours do I value my time? It just gets into a, a, a realm of, of like price shopping and hourly billing that like, I just don't think is beneficial to anybody. So if they do think that they could do it with a X number of time, I think that, you know, yeah, you start to, you're clearly not that valuable in their eyes. They're like, you're just a set of hands. So I, yeah, I would agree that that's a bad one. And this, this is a good time to bring up. I mean, 
maybe you have a company that you want to be a set of hands and that's fine. There right. are a lot of companies and organizations that do that. There's a need for it and people do it and they're happy with it. I think in this show, we're not happy with it. We have, cho you know, we've made a choice to put things in place to get us the highest chances of success, right? That's right. what we're talking right. about here right. for everybody. No, no, no. That's, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's, not, yeah, right. There's some businesses and there's some, you know, owners who you do want to be the order taker. Although I'd be surprised because I think once you experience life as the expert and the authority and the person who's able to set the tone and set the pace and get respect, you know, one I've been, I've been at both ends and I can say that it, you know, it's, there is one that just maybe just works better for me, but just feels better in general. Um, right. I think, I think a good, uh, maybe a good exercise, if you're not sure if your client is going to be a customer or if you're, if you're the person you're talking to is going to be a client or a customer and expect customer service or client service is to do a small engagement, you know, like break down before you get That's into like, a, before you marry somebody, you know, like date them first. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. like take them out to dinner with like a small project, a discovery or like an initial, it's just a way to, to spend some time with them, see their, their, their dynamic, their, the way they present themselves, the way they uh, look at you and respect you. You can get a sense of how much they value you with the way you're charging for some of these smaller engagements before you take a lot of money from somebody. And now you are, you've lost all the power in the relationship because you've counted on that cash and you're, you're not really ready to for, you know, give it back but you need it. And they, so like, then you just turn into like a very, it's a, it's not a good spiral. If you take a lot of money from somebody who's not the right fit for you. So, um, so I think smaller engagements now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the fear of the bigger project is you get to the end. They didn't, they haven't achieved the outcome that they want. And now you have taken 10, whatever, 10, 20, $30,000 of their money. All they remember right. is that they paid you for something and didn't get what they want. And, right. and again, nobody wants to be in that situation. No. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and another piece of language that I thought of when you were kind of going through some of this stuff is the, like, what, what are some words, some keywords to watch out for whenever I hear someone say that they're looking for vendors to me, like that's not, it's different than the word partner. Like, and I noticed that once I'm having a conversation with somebody and they use the word partner, I, I immediately perk up. I'm, I think, okay, like we're on equal footing. We're both contributing to something like there's, there's like, I'm coming with my expertise and, and my power and they're coming with their expertise and their power. But when you do vendor, it immediately creates like a, a hierarchy where you are subservient to them. Uh, and I think even if technically I mean, I think that that's, it's all about perception, the power in these relationships. And so, um, right. So the other thing is, you know, we talked about the warning signs before you take on a client. What if you have a client, right? And you start to, see, what are the warning signs or, or how do you start to hand, handle that erosion? Or better yet, here's a new, here, I'll throw it a little twist here. Okay. What if uh, the person in the, there's a change in your contact at the organization and now you're in the middle of this project and you've got a new person and they're not on the same page here. They're back to, you're the order taker. I need this tomorrow. Just get it done. How do we get in when we find ourselves slipping there, Dylan, how do we get out of it? Yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's a good question. I think a lot of it depends on how it manifests itself. If it manifests itself in the, ex client now customer asking you to do things that are again, that go contrary to their best interests and therefore contrary to your best interests. If you care about the outcomes of the project, then mm -hmm. I think you should start by asking for them to support the validity of their request. I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, clients expect to be able to say things and, and, and state things and claim things. <laughs> And don't expect it to be challenged on how valid or true those things are. And so if you do ask them to support that with examples or data, uh, I think you can, you, even if they, even if you don't get that, you start to make them realize, right, I should be thinking about those things. Let me go find some examples. Oh, I'm not seeing a lot of those examples. Could I be wrong? Ideally, you create that switch 
Like, you know, when we have clients who do that for design related things, whether it's weird design ideas on a website or like really bad branding ideas, we ask them, you know, do you have examples of other brands doing it that way? You know, like show us where you see successful brands doing that. And most of the time there's crickets, right? And, it, and so I think that that starts to send a message. And then the other component of that might be to ask them if they've had any success with this approach in the past. So um, to see, do, has this worked for you? This, this kind of behavior or, or, or this, this, this thing you're, you're asking for, have you had success with this in the past? Because again, maybe you're wrong as the, as, the, as the expert. It's possible that clients are coming to you with new knowledge. Like you have to be willing to accept that, but ask them to back it up or at least to, to reinforce that claim a little bit before you just kind of say yes. Right. And you were, you know, I think you're saying, um, I know you and I want to make sure the listeners understand this comes across in a different way than what we're communicating right now. It might be, you know, no one's clicking to my website. I want to change the the title to this and I want to change a graphic and I'll say, I'll go and do some research and I'll say, that's weird because a thousand people came to the website. Like, help me see the information you're seeing before we make this change because Right. I think this change is actually going to get you, you know, when we, when we did this thing for you, this project, you told me you wanted X and changing that I think is going to get you further from X. So help me understand, like, where is this right. coming from? Maybe, maybe there's a glitch somewhere or maybe, maybe they have bad information, right? So we're not saying challenge them, prove to me you need this. We're saying we're, we're trying to be like a guard and making sure that they're, they're asking for things based on accurate information, especially where, um, if it hurts them, like you said, it hurts us. So right. I think that's really, yeah. really useful information. Yeah. I mean, I think this other, this next one too, kind of plays into what you're saying. Cause I know what you're, you're, you're trying to soften the blow a little bit of that language, right? You and definitely think, want to soften the blow. <laughs> I, think, I think as, as a person in, in our position, for example, we tr have to tread a line between deciding how much we care about being right and how much we care about being liked. And I think, um, you know, some people are, are super focused on being right all the way to the, you know, and willing to sacrifice any likability. But likability is critical for business success, especially in a referral, people, human-centric operation where you're engaging with people. If you're not liked, it's like, you're just, it's just not gonna work out for you the way, way you think it is. Like if you're super focused on being right, go code behind a, a screen, you know, instead, if you're working with people, you got to find a mix. You got to be willing to, you have to find how much you care about how much you're willing to sacrifice being right in order to maintain a, a good working relationship with your client. Um, I think that that's pragmatic advice. Um, I think this next point about leveraging the power of no is a, is, is a tricky one. And it, and it, it forces you to grapple with that idea. It's like when, when, Dale, I'll ask you this, like when, when is it appropriate to just tell them no? I would never say no, but if changes are being asked that impact my team, right? Um, and they no longer become a client that aligns with, I think how we operate, I would have to suggest that maybe they've outgrown us and they find somebody new. So a great example would be, I need a form on my website. So there's an emergency, you know, or, uh, you know, this probably applies more to you than to me. Um, I need a form on my website. So if there's an emergency, they can fill it out. And I know there's a problem. Well, guess what? Forms get lost. They go to spam. So that's not actually a great request. Mm. And if my team's getting constantly beat on because we made this thing that's not really serving the purpose, I have to step back and say, hey, you know, this has impacted us in a negative way. And I might suggest maybe they've outgrown us. I will still do it um, because I'll just do it. But again, when it comes to the point where I'm uncomfortable and every time my heart skips and I'll tell people, you know, every time I see an email from you, like I get anxiety, you know, because right. I've lost control of this. It's right. kind of not, it's a fiasco. I, and I will be honest with people and I'll say, I don't, I just, we got to either fix this or we have to part ways. And I'll say it in a very nice way, right. but um, I'll still do it. 
you know, I'll right. do it. And I'll, but then I'll say, yeah, we're not going to play this game again. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, the, the no, the no is a very, it's tough to tell someone no without telling them no. Right. Like it's, it's an art, you know, to tell them no without telling them no, like you're saying it's, it's no, but it's, it's kind of, it's not even no, it's yes now, but later no, or something kind of along those lines. It's, right. Well, like, it's kind of like, oh, you want to go on a trampoline, you know, after you've been drinking in the pub all night? Sure, just right. sign here. Just sign right. this paper that says I have nothing to do with this. Well, that's hilarious because <laughs> actually my next point was that if the stakes are high enough, if the stakes are high enough, like we're talking like for us, it's major project and they're asking for something where it's just like, no, this should not be done and you're going to hate this later. Make them sign something. You know, like even if it's a simple, basic document with no legal enforcement, you're not doing it so that you can rake them over the coals later. It's basically just so that when they forget what it is they asked for or why something is the way that it is, you can show them a piece of paper and say, you asked for this. This is what you requested. Like, and you acknowledge that because the amount of times I've been in the position of saying, of recommending or, or pushing back against a, a request or an idea from a client only to succumb to that and then later to face the client who asks why we did it this way and what the issue is. And for me to not really be in a position to try and like drudge up the past and like line by line email forwarding of like things they said or pull up a recording. Oh, of a meeting. No. You just can't do that. It's just like you lose, you lose more than you win there, you know, and that's unfortunate. So assigning can be useful. Right. And I would say, you know, um, we're coming up against the clock here. True. Um, my final thought would be there aren't a lot of clients like this, hmm. but you're going to get them. Right. And when you do get them, depending on the size, it can be very, it can hurt your reputation. You know, we both have companies that have five star reviews. I guard that very carefully. Right. I want every project to be five stars. You know, maybe that's selfish or unrealistic, but I want to, and I have to start out thinking that, and this process has been a lifesaver for me. And when you get into this position, it not only affects your customer and you, but it also affects the people that work for you. I never want to create a situation for someone that works for me that they have to come in and not be successful. That's a horrible feeling as a business right. owner. Right. Yeah. No way do we want a culture and environment where we're we're doing things that are wrong because people ask for them. Right. So it's just right. not good for self-esteem. So I think that was great. Um, anything else to add before we sign off? Nope. That's it. I, uh, we're just going to keep trucking on. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's a, that's a wrap folks.